Today, as we come to the table. So the Lord is going to do the same thing by spreading the gospel to all the world at the very end as he did back at the very beginning. Isn't that cool? And again, that whole picture of that revived Roman Empire. Well, let's jump into it. We've only got a few minutes left. Acts chapter 1. Notice that we have the foundation now. Let's jump into it. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Notice, first of all, what he began to do and teach. We've already talked about that. This was not the end when Jesus ascended. It's the beginning of the church. And today, Jesus is still speaking. He's still working. He's still transforming lives. And the church is still moving forward. Luke recorded everything that Jesus began to do in Luke and Acts. But if he began his work then, it continued after that. Jesus continues to speak, to move, and to make all things new as he works through his church in the present day. He wasn't finished speaking when he ascended to heaven. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Since he wasn't finished speaking, Pastor Mark reminds us that he is still speaking to you today. He works through his spirit to move the church forward. He works through his spirit to move you forward and to make you more like himself. However you feel today, you are not alone as you pursue the holiness of God. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 1 as he continues his message, The Continuing Story. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then Luke continued right on in writing the book of Acts. And people believe that it used to be one book that they split up into a gospel and the other, but either way, Luke is the writer of both, and it's an amazing book in how it links the Gospels into the New Testament. It's like this bridge that shows art. Here's where the Gospel was when Jesus came. Here's where the church started, and we'll see that in the first part of Acts, and then it moves right into what God has been doing the last 2,000 years. And again, we're going to see that language, what Jesus began to do and teach. He's not done. He just started. And so there's going to be this continuation. Luke is kind of a bridge to that. We see the link between them. The very last thing that Luke talks about is the church waiting on the power of God to fall on them, the promise from the Father. And then the very first thing that Luke talks about here in the book of Acts is them again, we're going to see waiting on the power of the Spirit to fall upon them. So you see that bridge. It kind of ends with one waiting on the outpouring of the Spirit. It goes into the Spirit being poured out and then God giving birth to His church. By the way, yesterday was the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Isn't that cool? And there's going to be a day where God is going to pour His Spirit out on the nation of Israel like He did the church. Because the Bible says in the last days, God will pour His Spirit out on them and they're going to be saved and begin to prophesy and all these other things. So there's a great awakening coming for the nation of Israel. But guys, I believe we need a great awakening in the church of America. We need to wake up. I'm concerned about the church. I really feel like the church is going to sleep. I really feel like the church is being lethargic. I think we're compromising. There's a lot of things happening. But more than ever in the days in which we live, guys, we need to be drawing closer to the Lord, not farther away. We need to be walking more in the spirit, not walking more in the flesh, because we're going to need it. Now, Uh, Another side note about Luke, as we go through this, we're probably going to point out some medical terminology that Luke uses, because again, Luke was a doctor. Doctors back then oftentimes were the slaves of their owner, and so some people believe that Theophilus was actually the owner of Luke, that Luke was the slave of Theophilus, that Theophilus probably got saved, and it holds to culture, because back then they would have their slaves as doctors. That would be great today, wouldn't it? All right. You know, I'll bill you. You know, but anyway, so... And so, again, some think, well, Theophilus got saved. And remember, Paul, when Paul was traveling, Paul had an ailment. He had a thorn in the flesh. Certainly, there was probably something wrong with his eyes as well as other things. So some believe that maybe Theophilus said, Luke, you're free to go and travel with Paul and be Paul's personal doctor. I love Paul. I want to support the ministry. You know, I don't, it doesn't tell us, but that is a speculation that's out there. And also, it would give an understanding to the account that he's giving. He's saying, oh, Theophilus, the former account that I gave, I'm now giving another account of what Jesus began to do. The former account was the book of Luke. 
This new now is working into the book of Acts. And so we see the very possibility, we know that Luke was a doctor, but the very possibility here of uh, Luke being connected to Theophilus in that way. Again, we don't know, uh, but it's, it's possible. Now, the timing of this, one other thing to point out, why was this such a perfect time for God to pour out his spirit and give birth to the church? It's amazing. You know, the Bible says that in the fullness of time, God gave his son, his only son. That phrase, the fullness of time, means this. It was perfect. It was perfect for spreading the gospel. Why so? A number of reasons. Number one, there was a worldwide language. Alexander the Great, when he took over right before the Romans, he made everybody learn Greek. Can you imagine somebody conquering the world and saying, everybody has to learn Greek? Whether you like it or not, you're going to learn Greek. Well, the bad thing was you had to learn some language you didn't want to learn, but the good thing was everybody in the world could talk with each other. So no matter where you traveled, you could speak the language. If they didn't speak English, you would just simply speak Greek. So think about that. Now, they didn't have English back then, but you get my point. So, I mean, that would be neat today if you could travel anywhere you wanted and talk to anybody and have some language. You know, it's funny. We in America pretty much speak one language, don't we? Over in Europe, they still speak multiple languages. That's why the joke over in Europe among the Christians is, in heaven, they know what language it's going to be. It's going to be English, because if it's any other language, none of us could ever talk. So that's kind of their joke. Well, see, and, and you know what? I didn't think it was funny either. <laughs> you guys are very perceptive. I like that. But anyway, <laughs> so again, but the whole world could speak the same language. Think about that. Everywhere they went to travel with the gospel, if they didn't know their language, they just spoke in Greek. Everybody could understand it. That was one. Number two, the Romans had uh, what they called the Pax Romana, world peace. They enforced a world peace by the sword, and so there were no wars going on anywhere unless Rome was doing it. So everywhere you traveled, it was peaceful all over the world. And the last thing is that Rome built roads all over the world so that there was an interstate system so it was easy travel. So you could, you know, hop on your camel, go wherever you wanted. There's no war. There's peace everywhere. The one universal language, everywhere you went, you could speak the language. So this was perfect for the gospel being spread. And it's kind of interesting when we think about the gospel being spread in our days, guys, really, you know, although there may not be one world language, we can now communicate by computers and electronics, even in other countries where we don't know each other's language. So almost the same setting back in that day is beginning to happen. The Bible says this Antichrist will bring in temporary world peace. There's going to be travel around the world unrestricted as there will not be any war during that time. And because of technology, communication is much easier even when you don't speak the language. So the Lord is going to do the same thing by spreading the gospel to all the world at the very end as he did back at the very beginning. Isn't that cool? And again, that whole picture of that revived Roman Empire. Well, let's jump into it. We've only got a few minutes left. Acts chapter 1. Notice that we have the foundation now. Let's jump into it. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Notice, first of all, what he began to do and teach. We've already talked about that. This was not the end when Jesus ascended. It's the beginning of the church. And today, Jesus is still speaking. He's still working. He's still transforming lives. And the church is still moving forward. Now, notice this Theophilus. Again, the name means lover of God, friend of God or lover of God. And so some have speculated that maybe this was just kind of Luke writing in general to the church. But I think it was a literal man by the name of Theophilus. And, and you know, it's what a great meaning. Think about that. Lover of God. Wouldn't that be a great meaning, you know, of your, of your name? What's your name? My name means lover of God. Now, I don't know if I'd want to be called Theophilus. You know, that's kind of, you know, Theophilus' name I could think to be called. But either way, the bottom line is, see, now it's hitting kind of slow. The bottom line is, it, it's a great name to have because of what it means. A great name. Again, church tradition says that Theophilus was ruling over Luke and all this, and, and he was his servant. Again, we don't know. But he's giving this account to this Theophilus, whoever this man is, whatever importance he has in his life, about what Jesus began to do and began to teach. It also appears here that the point that Luke physically joined up with Paul was when Paul went to Macedonia. Because I want you guys to note this. As we go through this, you're going to see that Paul here, or when Luke writes this, he writes from the third person. Up until we get to the point of Macedonia, and then suddenly it switches over to the first person, and so we see this kind of change begin to take place as he joins in with him at some point here, talking about what they began to do and teach, but still at this point from the outside. And notice he said he did this until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Guys, note that. That is key here. Why? Because sometimes I hear the question, who was the 12th apostle that took the place of Judas? Remember Peter stood up and he drew straws. 
And they were doing the lot. That was the way they believed that God would lead them back then before the Holy Spirit. And they chose this guy by the name of Matthias. I do not believe Matthias was the one that took the place of Judas. That's the last time you ever hear about Matthias. He's never spoken of again in the rest of the Bible. And I think that's because it was a fleshly thing that Peter did. I mean, Peter, again, remember, the Spirit had not yet been given. Peter stands up and says, let's do this thing. And they pick this guy. But this guy was not handpicked by the Lord. Every one of the apostles, Jesus handpicked and they visibly saw him. Can you think of anyone else that was handpicked that visibly saw the Lord after Judas fell? Paul. Remember Paul riding on the road to Damascus? God knocks him off of his horse and the Lord appears to him and tells him, you're going to be my apostle. So again, notice he makes the point here, those whom he had chosen, that is whom the Lord had chosen. And he says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible, I have that underlined, many infallible proofs being seen by then during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now guys, this is huge. And why is this huge? Because there are people today who still doubt Jesus Christ and that he's who he said he was, that he was God in human form, that he's coming back again, that he's come once. There are some that even say he didn't resurrect. But notice this, he says, they experienced Jesus' resurrection by what? Many infallible proofs. Notice, not just infallible, but many. They personally saw him alive, not one or two times. He was there, the Bible says, for 40 days, revealing himself to them. During 40 days, it says, speaking to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God with these infallible truths. Now, it's interesting. The word infallible here is the word tekmerion, and it means this, it means that from which something is purely and plainly known and comes with the implication of certainty. I love that. In other words, we have no doubt that Jesus came, died, resurrected, and is God in human form. And we are here to proclaim that. Now that's powerful. Do you know none of the early followers of Jesus ever questioned his resurrection? There was only one, and that was just for a moment. Remember Thomas? Thomas? He questioned it until the Lord showed up and said, all right, Thomas, you're doubting. Feel my hands. You know, put your hand on my side where the spear went in. I am alive. It is I. And then, of course, he believed and said, my Lord and my God. And so none of them ever questioned the Lord. It says he met with them for 40 days during that time, meeting with them on a regular basis, teaching them about the things of the kingdom. As a matter of fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, over 500 people saw the Lord at one time. Think about that. Now, if you were to go to a court of law and try to prove that Jesus was alive after the resurrection, how many people do you think you'd need to take the stand? I mean, one after another. I saw him, I saw him, I saw him. Okay, 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 he rose, he's alive. Now, to us, we may think that's a small thing because we take that for granted. But guys, realize, in the world today of doubters, that is powerful. Our leader rose from the dead, and there are many infallible proofs that he rose from the dead. We can have confidence in who we believe and what we believe. Maybe that doesn't excite you, but it excites me. Because so many religions, they just kind of don't have anything. They're, you know, people often accuse Christians of having blind faith. Our faith is anything but blind. We have infallible proofs. Them, blind faith. Because there's nothing to back it up. Their leaders didn't get up from the dead. They don't have the evidence. They don't have the prophecies. They don't have the proofs. We do. And so this is awesome. It's not a fake man-made religion. It's the real deal. But the thing that is the most convincing proof to me is that all of the Lord's followers were willing to go to their death for his name. Now, not all of them died, but they were all willing to go to their death. All the apostles, except for one, were put to death. John's the only one that didn't. Remember, they tried to boil him in oil, Kentucky Fried John. I should say, you know, Patmos Fried. Actually, it was probably not on Patmos. It was on the mainland. Then they sent him to Patmos. And in Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation. But the bottom line is, listen, maybe one person would be willing to die for Buddhism. Maybe two for Hinduism. Maybe, maybe one for New Age or whatever, because I believe so much in this, I'm willing to die. But everybody? Guys, if you ever doubted your faith, this should strengthen you to the point you realize every one of them are willing to die. All the apostles gave their life, and countless millions have over the centuries because they believe in Jesus Christ. You don't do that for a man-made religion. You don't do that because you want to fit in and feel like this is what I really believe. You know, you find out what you really believe when the pressure gets hot, don't you? Many infallible proofs. And as we go through the book of Acts, we're going to see more of these infallible proofs. We're going to see the move of God, the move of the Spirit. We're going to see how it applies to the church today. But guys, as we finish today, it's interesting, as I was studying about this, the infallible proofs, 
it really struck me, God still gives us infallible proofs today. It's not just something God gave them back then. God gives infallible proofs still today. And there were a couple that were amazing while we were in Israel that I want to share with you. One I had forgotten and now remember, another that was brand new to me. When you talk about the infallible proofs of God, the infallible proof of his word, the infallible proof of his son, the infallible proof that all the prophecies that he said are going to come to pass. We were up there in the area of Dan. Now, when you come into Dan, it is the northernmost part of Israel, and that is where Abraham first entered the land. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you the land. And Abraham came in in the land of Dan, which is really cool because in Dan they uncovered, get this, the oldest gate to a city in the world. The the oldest known gate to a city in the world, made out of mud bricks, over 4,000 years old. And we got to see it. And again, they said that when Abraham came in, that would have been the gate he would come into in the northern part of Israel, entering the city of Dan. So very likely, Abraham went through that gate. But that's not the coolest part of it. What the guide said was this. Historians know that from their calculations, Abraham entered the land that God had promised to give him in 1,000 948 B.C. That's before Christ. Immediately bells and whistles went off. Guys, what is 1,948 B.C.? 1948 B.C. Guys, when did God give the Jews the land back here in our generation? 1948 A.D. 1,948 A.D. You see, God said, Abraham, I'm giving you the land. And Abraham entered the land in 1948 B.C. And the God said, I'm going to take you out of the land, but in the last days I'm going to bring you back. And wouldn't it have to be just like God in 1948 A.D. to say, welcome back? Is it amazing or what? By the way, all coincidence. (laughs) Really, Christians are nuts. (laughs) They're Looney Tunes. They believe this stuff. Then we got to the Temple Mount. And there's a tunnel that they've built down there. They've gone down to the Herodian Road and down to the lowest stones that Herod built on the western side of the Temple Mount Wall. And you can actually walk down in that tunnel and go down that wall all the way down through there underground because Jerusalem has been destroyed so many times. There are cities built on top of cities. So you're down under this tunnel walking down all the way down to the road of Herod and all the way down where these things are. And we came to this one place there where they said, now this rock right here, they've measured it, they've calculated it, and this rock right here is directly behind the Dome of the Rock which the Jews believe is where the third temple is going to be built. I don't believe that. I believe it's going to be built to the north of the Dome of the Rock because to the north of the Dome of the Rock is a big open area that goes right out the eastern gate. And the Bible says when the Lord comes back, he's going to come in the eastern gate and enter into the temple. So I believe it's going to be to the the north of that, and that's neither here nor there, but that's what I believe. But we're at this rock, and we pass by this rock, and the guide says, now notice the rock is green. And all I hear is notice the rock is green. I'm kind of back in the line. the, The rock's green. Okay, what's the deal? I finally asked her, why is the rock green? Well, before I tell you this, remember what it says when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to set his throne on the Temple Mount. And from the southern part of the throne, what's going to come running out of it? A river. There's going to be a spring that's going to bubble up and spring out from the south side of the throne, come out. The Bible says it'll go down, hit the Jordan, link up with the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea will spring to life. It'll bring healing to the Dead Sea and there'll be fish in it and everything. Then it's going to go down to the Mediterranean, touch the oceans of the world and heal all the oceans of the world and all the pollution and all the things that have happened during the Great Tribulation. They'll all be restored like they were to pristine back in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says. And it's going to bubble out from the south side of the throne. Well, I asked her, I said, hold on, I missed that. Why is the rock green? She said, well, they've discovered a spring under the Temple Mount. And the water is coming up and turning the rocks green underneath because it's saturating them. And I was like, another coincidence. (laughs) I'm seeing the most amazing coincidences. Amazing. And guys, what's really cool about this, they said that that stone, because they wanted to know where the dome of the rock was because they feel that's where the temple is going to be built, where the water is bubbling up, that's where the dome is. I believe it's to the left for a number of reasons I won't go into. Abraham and his sacrifice and all those things. But anyway, the, the bottom line is, if it is over where I believe it's going to be, guess where the southern side of that throne's going to be? Right where that green rock is. Where the water's bubbling up in the middle of the Temple Mount and is going to run out from under the throne. Guys, listen. These are all exciting things that we can go wow about. But here's the bottom line as we leave today. 
It's a wow to see God's accuracy, to see how true the Bible is, to see God's power, to be watching prophecy and all these things come to pass before our very eyes. That's a great wow. And I'm as excited as you are. I expect wow from our God. How about you? But that wow does you no good if you don't know him. If you don't know him, it does you no good. You're not a part of the family. So my appeal to you is this. Look, if you don't know the Lord, if you've heard these kind of things today and you still don't believe, I don't know that you ever will. What's it going to take to convince you? Jesus Christ coming down in the clouds of glory? Maybe, but then it's too late. Because the Bible says when he comes down in the clouds of glory, he's going to gather the nations in front of him and judge everyone based on what they decided before that moment. So it's not like, oh, there he is, I believe. Okay, Lord, I right now give my life to you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Whoo, that was close. Guys, it's got to be done now. Here's my appeal to you. If you've not given your life to the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Guys, you can celebrate with us in the kingdom. You know, Jerusalem Day was really neat, but there's not going to be anything like Jesus Day when he comes back. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you, Lord, for your word and your power. How we thank you, Lord God, for just seeing how true your word is by seeing the nation of Israel and watching your word just come to pass before our very eyes. All the things that you said were going to happen, Lord, going over to Israel and just seeing the book of Revelation come alive, seeing the other books of the Bible happening in front of my very eyes. Lord, it's amazing what it does for your faith, the truth of your word, the fact that all that you said, every jot and tittle is true and will come to pass. And God, we thank you for that. And God, as believers in here right now, we rejoice over that. And I thank you for showing us what you show us so that we can be wowed and we can be excited. But Lord, my heart right now is with any that have never given their life to you. Because right now, your Holy Spirit is convicting them and showing them this is real. This is not a game. This is not some man-made religion. This is not Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism or something that men came up with that has no power and their leaders are dead. This is God risen from the dead saying that he alone is the only way to the Father. No one goes to the Father except by me is what you said, Lord. And your word says in Acts again that there's no other name under heaven or earth by which a man can be saved. There may be some right here, right now, that need, Lord, to be rescued from their sin. They know they're a sinner. They know they need to be rescued. And now your spirit is convicting them of the truth of your, of your word. If that's you, then here's what the Bible says. Jesus died on the cross. He rose the third day. And if you will simply confess your sin and receive him as Lord, you will be saved. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer right now with me. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. And I confess my sin to you. Lord, forgive me. Wash me clean. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I give my life to you. And I am yours. Father, I thank you for the work of your Spirit this morning. In encouraging us as believers already. But more importantly, God, of any that you may have brought into the kingdom this morning. We give you all the glory. And how we look forward to Jesus' day when you break the clouds open and you grab your bride and we feast with you in the kingdom. And then, Lord, you come back and establish your throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years and then forever with the new heaven and the new earth. How we can't wait, Lord, to see you come and bring your righteousness and your justice to a world that needs it so desperately. Make us your witnesses. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us your boldness and your power in the days in which we live to be your ambassadors. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. While our time at the table of God's word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Acts. From the inspiring faith of Stephen to walking through Paul's conversion to observing how the early church grew and thrived, there's much more to gain from this eventful book. Jesus had promised to send a helper, and he certainly delivered in sending his spirit to overflowing in these new Christians. It must have been an exciting and also very challenging period of time that these men and women were getting to be a part of. If there was something in this message that you need to hear again, you can go to thewaymedia.net and navigate to Come to the Table to Listen to or download this or other messages. You can also download the Way Media app so you know when new broadcasts are happening. If you're a prayer warrior, we very much value your consistent prayers during this study through Acts. God can do mighty things through the faithful prayers of those who seek after Him. We're earnestly expecting Him to do big things in and through this radio ministry. We're thankful for your prayers, and we're trusting God to use this platform to get the word out and for it to spread like wildfire. Pastor Mark has more to share through the book of Acts, so we hope you'll be able to join us next time. 
We look forward to what will be shared about these people of faith and the trials and triumphs they faced as they walk out their lives in a way that sought to honor God. May these accounts inspire you to do the same and to come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.